Hello and welcome to this last video on genre bearings, the last video in this chapter. Well, in this last video, I will talk about the static equilibrium and how to linearize the bearing forces around that or in that static equilibrium position. First of all, what is static equilibrium? Static equilibrium is defined as the vanishing of the velocities in circumferential and radial direction of the shaft. If these velocities are zero, then the position of the shaft in that bearing is a constant. The displacements are then constant, which means that he takes an equilibrium position, so he remains at the same position, uh, the shaft inside that bearing, not necessarily in the center of the bearing, of course, so there can be some displacement, but these displacements are constant. And we will be able to compute the displacements from a false balance if we consider all the forces acting on the shaft. And that will be do, done later on. But first, let's look at these conditions and let's figure out what the bearing forces are in the equilibrium position. Well, first of all, from the equilibrium positions, we have to get the positive pressure here. So determine the values theta 1 and theta 2. Then we have to compute with these values theta 1 and theta 2 our integrals, famous integrals we solved in the last video, and from that we get the restoring forces. So um, I recall that this was the expression for the tangent theta. 2 epsilon prime divided by epsilon 1 minus 2 gamma prime. And we discussed that expression in detail in the last video. Now, in this video, things are easy because if epsilon prime is equal to zero, then the whole expression will be equal to zero. So the tangent theta will be equal to zero. Now the question is again, where's the positive pressure here? Is it between zero and pi or between pi and two pi? And well, if you look at the discussion we did, then, well, of course, you could say, well, but this case is not included. Well, it is included. Epsilon prime is equal to zero, but one minus two gamma prime is still positive, namely one, just clearly positive. So we need a negative sine function, and therefore we are in the second half. So we are between pi and two pi. So the correct solution for the positive pressure here is Theta 1 is equal to alpha 1 is equal to pi, and theta 2 is equal to alpha 2 is equal to 2 pi all. I would say the correct answer is first for theta 1 and theta 2, and then from Sommerfeld substitution, you obtain for these values of, of theta, you easily obtain that alpha 1 is equal to pi, and alpha 2 is then equal to 2 pi. This allows me to compute the integrals here. And you see, that all the integrals still depend on epsilon. We have seen that epsilon appears there as a factor in all these integrals, but the rest is then easy to solve. It's just here, minus two epsilon divided by one minus epsilon squared squared. Here we have a pi divided by two, one plus two epsilon squared, and we have to divide by one minus epsilon squared to the power of five divided by two. And here we have one divided by one minus epsilon squared, three divided by two pi divided by two. And from this, we get the restoring forces. Yeah? So uh, I skip the computations because they are technical. You um, evaluate the terms, including either I311 and I302 or I311 and I320 with the appropriate coefficients, of course. And if you do the computations, you will end up with the following result that shows that F sub R and F sub gamma, so our forces in a radial and circumferential direction are just functions of epsilon. And now I would like to determine that static equilibrium position and therefore I need a balance of forces. So I have to switch from the genre bearing side to the um, rotor dynamic side, so to speak. And so at the first step, I will copy the forces that we need, and then we apply a force equilibrium. And the only force we assume here is a vertical external force. There are no um, inertia forces included here. So as there would be perhaps no imbalance or nothing else, 
Um, so there is just the equilibrium with an external force, static equilibrium, that we consider, and this would lead to the quasi-static, because the rotor is still rotating, <laughs> the, the quasi-static equilibrium position of the rotor shaft. So uh, we do the um, equilibrium in vertical and in lateral direction, so with respect to space fixed coordinates, and therefore we have to project, as, we, as you have seen on the last slide of the last video, we have to project to uh, Cartesian coordinates um, by fr cosine gamma and minus f gamma sine gamma and by fr sine gamma and f gamma cosine gamma. In total, therefore, now the angle gamma appears here, we have two unknowns, epsilon and gamma, the static equilibrium positions, and we have two equations. Unfortunately, the expressions for epsilon and gamma appear uh, in a nonlinear manner in this equation, but that does not prevent us to, to solve, right? And to go further. So for the attitude angle, you will find from the second equation that the tangent of gamma is equal to the negative ratio of f gamma and f r. And you can then insert this expression. That's good if we have such a ratio between, because all these constants here at the very beginning will disappear. And we just have an expression that includes the eccentricity ratio epsilon. So therefore, we see that this relation, so the second equation, allows us to relate the tangent gamma to epsilon. So therefore, we have to use the first equation to establish an equation that governs epsilon. Once we have solved the equation for epsilon, we can plug in the value for epsilon here and we will get the corresponding value for the attitude angle gamma. So um, in order to do this, we have to replace cosine gamma and sine gamma by equations that contain epsilon only. Well, this is possible because you can switch between the tangent gamma and the sine and the cosine function by a well-known classical formula that are derived on the basis well, of the definition of the tangent first and second um, on the basis of the trigonometric Pythagoras. So for the sine gamma, that would be tangent gamma, one plus tangent squared gamma square root, and for the cosine gamma, it would be one divided by one plus tangent gamma squared. Uh, well, what you can see here, what you can um, already estimate is that the expression for epsilon that we obtain at the very end is not a simple one, not a linear equation. That would be a miracle, right? Because we have nonlinearities included in fr in f gamma and nonlinearities for epsilon included when we replace the tangent gamma and then we have also here to divide. So there will be a very complicated expression for epsilon. I will state it for you. And that expression will include the force F and these um, uh, parameters of the problem. So we put everything that includes these parameters on one side. We put everything that, uh, that includes epsilon on the other side. And what we then get is the following expression here. So, this is the expression how epsilon depends on the system parameters, on the problem parameters. And what is important to note is only um, how they affect epsilon. No? So, you can see that some parameters appear here in the numerator, like that force, like the clearance C. Uh, for R, well, you could say for R, there is no dependence that appears here and there. And um, B, for example, appears in the denominator. Mu and omega appear also in the denominator. So the effect of F and C on the one hand, maybe we focus on F, on the force. What kind of force is this here? That would be gravity. Yeah? So the, the dead load of the rotor. Um, and for example, omega, which would be another important parameter, they act opposite no? for the moment.
Well, as these are um, parameters of the problem, one abbreviates them by introducing a constant. And um, as you can see, the second one is dimensionless. So the second factor here is dimensionless. So the first factor must also be dimensionless because the left-hand side is dimensionless. Epsilon is the ratio, eccentricity ratio, so it's clearly uh, dimensionless. So this is the famous Sommerfeld number that characterizes journal bearings. Not only journal bearings, but also includes F here, um, the dead load. And um, it includes with omega, another dy dynamical parameter, namely the rotational speed. And there is one other parameter, one divided by beta squared, which would be here 2r squared, 2r divided by beta squared. So beta itself would be b divided by 2r. And the whole expression is then called the modified Sommerfeld number, and that's what we want to investigate. So we see that epsilon is completely determined by this modified Sommerfeld number. So we could prescribe a modified Sommerfeld number that we want to realize in our design. From that modified Sommerfeld number, we would get the epsilon. And from epsilon, we would get tangent gamma. So a prescribed design then prescribes the equilibrium position of the rotor in both terms, in epsilon and in gamma. On the next slide, I will show you then the figures showing the dependence of epsilon and gamma on SM. Uh, well, and I have to admit, that was not the way you will find in Elias also the little MATLAB programs I used to draw these figures. That was not the way I've drawn these figures because solving here for epsilon is tremendously difficult. It's much more easier than to prescribe a value for epsilon. So to scan the range of values from 0 to 1 of epsilon to compute the modified Sommerfeld number then from that formula and to plug it in the epsilon here also to compute the value of gamma. So then we use that formula and this formula to compute the modified Sommerfeld number and the angle uh, gamma. And then we obtain figures relating epsilon to SM and also relate um, tangent of gamma to SM. And this is shown on the, that figure here. So you will find the modified Sommerfeld number and you will find the eccentricity ratio. So for low modified, summer, modified Sommerfeld numbers, you will get an eccentricity ratio that is close to one. And then this eccentricity ratio drops down close to zero here. For the attitude angle, the behavior is diff different. So we start at low angles for low modified Sommerfeld numbers, and we go up to very high values for high modified Sommerfeld numbers. Um, I would say, well, modified Sommerfeld numbers, what does it tell you? you? You won't feel so familiar with that. So therefore, let's pick these two physical parameters. The force, what happens if I increase the force? And what happens if I increase the rotational velocity? Well, how does the modified Sommerfeld number depends on the rotational velocity and on the force? Well, keep in mind that the modified Sommerfeld number appears here in the denominator, at the same place where omega, the rotational velocity speed, appears. So if you increase SM, you increase the rotational velocity if you keep all the other parameters the same. On the other hand, F, the force, appeared in the numerator. So if you increase SM and you keep all the other physical parameters the same, then you have to um, decrease F, so reduce the, the dead load. Yeah? So by, therefore, by increasing omega, you decrease the eccentricity ratio. By increasing omega, you decrease the eccentricity ratio. That result is known to you in modified form from the Jeffcott order, that's something like the self-centering effect. And if you decrease um, the value 
for the eccentricity ratio. At the same time, you increase the attitude angle to 90 degrees. No? Um, what happens with the force? Well, if you increase the force, you are, I would say, rather in static or quasi-static situation where everything is quasi-static because we are in equilibrium, but it is a situation where the influence of the rotation and speed does not matter. So you have a large eccentricity ratio. Um, it's the same if you look at these magnification factors for imbalances yeah? and low angles. Much better representation is if we look at that center point and if we draw the trajectory uh, for change either of the modified Sommerfeld number, which is increased along that trajectory, or the rotational speed that is also increased, or the force F that is decreased along that trajectory. So if we plot these two figures, namely gamma and um, eccentricity ratio, so a radial distance and an angle in a polar plot, in a polar diagram, then we can easily imagine so this would be the, the bearing housing where the shaft, there's the center of the shaft sits. So, uh, well, of course, this is not the complete bearing housing. Um, otherwise, such a position would not be possible. Um, but um, it's, it's a, a circle, the bearing housing is a circle with the same um, center here. Yeah? So we would start here just in vertical direction with an attitude angle that well, is then close to zero. We increase the Sommerfeld number, therefore the radial distance decreases and at the same time the angle moves to 90 degrees, which would be this angle here. Yeah? So we, at, oh, we obtain a result well, in the center of the bearing, so self-centering effect, not by coming in vertical direction, but by entering from the horizontal direction here. This is very important because if you do a change, well, for example, if you change the force, you would think that maybe the rotor reacts also in vertical direction because the force, the dead load, acts in vertical direction. However, what you can see is if you are close to that equilibrium position, your rotor would act by a horizontal motion. And from this fact, you can already expect or suppose at least, <laughs> yeah, be very careful that there might be stability problems. Now, always if you do exert a force in one direction and your system acts in another direction, you should be very careful. You know this from the famous Euler cases of deflection where, where you press a bar in vertical direction and then it reacts in horizontal direction. And you know that there are stability problems. And the same um, reasoning should tell you that at least um, it's worth to investigate the stability of such a system that reacts in this way, yeah? where, you, where you do something in vertical direction, in this case reduce the vertical force and the displacement appears in horizontal direction. And be always careful if you see such a situation. So therefore, in the next chapter, we would like to study the stability of the rotor bearing system. But in order to do this, we need the stiffness and damping coefficients. So let me come to the stiffness and damping coefficients, last part of this video, last part of this chapter. So therefore, we have to linearize around static equilibrium. And this then yields for the next chapter classical ordinary differential equations for vibrations. That's the point where we meet the ordinary differential equations. How do we linearize the forces? Well, first of all, we write the Taylor series expansion. Taylor series expansions with respect to displacements. You can see here the radial displacement. And what you can see here is a circumferential displacement where the arc length is taken. You see a delta gamma, so a slight deviation or disturbance of the angle gamma. So a slight change of the angle gamma, I would say, which is then multiplied by the radial coordinate by E in order to get that arc length. And you see also here, we have to divide by E 
and have to take dfr by d gamma. We do the same with the uh, corresponding velocities here. So taking the velocity of E gamma and taking the velocity of delta gamma, so of delta E and of delta gamma. And also here for the derivative, we take velocities and then we multiply here by E and divide by E to get this expression. So this will be, and the same in with the gamma coordinates, this will be these, um, differential, uh, these derivatives that appear here. They will form the stiffness matrix, at least in radial and circumferential direction. So with the radial and circumferential displacements, and it will here form the, um, the damping coefficient or matrix of the damping coefficients. So the stiffness and damping coefficients in radial and tangential direction are defined as follows. You see here the stiffness matrix and you see that I assembled here all these coefficients. You see a negative sign because we are interested in the restoring forces. Keep in mind Fr and F gamma are the forces in radial and in circumferential directions and the restoring forces as reaction forces just at, act in the opposite sense. No? Okay, these are stiffness and damping coefficients. Now we did most of the computations in dimensionless form. So therefore the question is what would be the appropriate dimensionless stiffness and damping coefficients here? Well, in order to obtain dimensionless quantities, we have to divide that equation by the force, by a reference force. And the only reference force we have is that force F that entered the static equilibrium, usually assigned to dead load. So we divide by F. We introduce then dimensionless perturbations here because these are dimensional quantities. So how can we obtain dimensionless perturbations? Well, we divide delta E by C and we divide, um, what do we have? We have um, epsilon delta gamma, we, uh, or E delta gamma, and for E delta gamma here, we write epsilon then delta gamma by um, dividing E also by C. That's, I would say, not very, uncommon. That's what we did before. Yeah. So we use the clearance to obtain dimensionless perturbations here. And finally, we have time derivatives there. Don't forget the time derivatives. So we have to introduce the dimensionless time. Dimensionless time t is again the uh, rotational speed times the physical time t. And then for the derivative d by dt, we find that this is d tau by dt, d by d tau, and d tau by dt is equal to omega. So therefore omega d by d tau. So then let's divide that equation by f. Then we get fr divided by f is fr not divided by f. And let's write, let's introduce these dimensionless stiffness and damping coefficients multiplied with these dimensionless quantities. Then the question is, how do they relate to that former equation? Well, therefore, we have to divide the former equation also by f, leading here to capital KRR divided by f. That's what you find here, Kig. All the terms have to be divided by f. The same holds for the damping coefficients that we have here. We have to divide them by f. But that's not the end of this story for the stiffness coefficient. You have to introduce the dimensionless displacements. That is, instead of delta E, you have to write delta epsilon times C here in order to be able to make a comparison of these coefficients. So at the very end for the stiffness coefficients, we obtain the C in the numerator um, and we divide by F. So C divided by F times the dimensional coefficients are then the dimensionless coefficients. How about the damping terms? There is a time derivative we have to take into account. So we have to replace the time derivative d by dt with a dimensionless time derivative in order to be able to make the comparison of the coefficients of this equation with 
that equation, so of the dimensional equation with the dimensionless equation. So therefore, we also have first to multiply by c in order to introduce the dimensionless perturbations here. Um, and then we have to um, replace the derivatives, so we get the omega here. Um, so it's c times omega divided by f, and you see this is the factor with which you have to multiply the dimensional damping coefficients to obtain the dimensionless damping coefficient. Well, and now we have to compute them, right? Sounds easy. We just take fr and f gamma that we obtained. We take our equilibrium position and we just we compute these derivatives we have seen um, that are the basis of these stiffness coefficients. Would that be the correct way to do this? No. Because if you do this, you do not follow the physics of that problem. The physics of that problem is that if you have a perturbation of the displacement, so radial displacement and angular displacement, you will have a perturbation of the gap, of the lubrication gap. That perturbation of the lubrication gap creates perturbations of the pressure field. These perturbations of the pressure field create perturbations of the forces. So you can't directly insert these or take the derivative of these forces with respect to um, the displacements. You would neglect the whole physics in that procedure. So what you learn here from perturbations for a physical problem, not for a mathematical one, you know, that's a big difference. Always introduce the perturbations at the starting point of your physical reasoning. And the starting point, again, for this displacement is the change in the lubrication gap. So we, we will introduce the perturbations right at the beginning of the physics and follow the whole procedure. You will say, oh my God, now he repeats all the videos he has done before. No, I will, of course, abbreviate the whole procedure. It's, I would say it's a good uh, repetition of what you have seen before. So let's start to introduce the perturbation in the equation for the dimensionless lubrication gap here. Recall that h was defined as being 1 minus epsilon cosine phi minus gamma. If we introduce no perturbations instead of epsilon, we write epsilon plus delta epsilon, and we write phi minus gamma plus delta gamma instead of phi minus gamma. Now the task is, of course, to do the computations here and to linearize everything with respect to perturbations. So to neglect second or higher orders in these perturbation and just do a first order perturbation analysis. So the result must be at the very end linear in the perturbations because our stiffness and damping coefficients are linear in these perturbations, they are first order Taylor series expansion. Okay, so let's start with a nice theorem for the cosine function here. So then we get cosine phi minus gamma, cosine delta gamma plus sine phi minus gamma, sine delta gamma. Okay, now let's linearize. So replace the cosine function by 1, replace the sine function by its argument, would be a first starting point. And then you see that you can get here also um, where do we get, for example, here, delta epsilon and delta gamma, second order effects that we have to uh, neglect. So we start with the zero order terms, which is 1 minus epsilon cosine phi minus gamma. We would have um, first order terms, delta epsilon cosine phi minus gamma and minus epsilon sine phi minus gamma, delta gamma coming from the first term, multiplied by the second term here. And finally, we would have second order effects, namely delta epsilon times sine phi minus gamma delta gamma, which are neglected here. So in total, we get a zero order term, one minus epsilon cosine phi minus gamma, and a first order perturbation, um, minus delta epsilon cosine phi minus gamma minus epsilon delta gamma sine phi minus, phi minus gamma. 
These terms now change or affect the pressure field. So let's compute the time derivatives and the derivatives with respect to phi, because that's what appears in, uh, at least in the numerator of the dimensionless pressure. So we need the derivatives. And the first thing we know is that the derivative of the zeroth order term is zero with respect to time. Why do I know this? Without doing any computation here, you can do the con computation and convince yourself, but I know this because that's the zeroth order term corresponds to the zeroth order term for, for the static perturbation, so, uh, for the static equilibrium, sorry, for the static equilibrium. And in static equilibrium, the time derivative has to be zero. So there can be only a contribution from, from a sub one, h sub one related to the time derivatives, which are remarked here by a prime again, of delta epsilon and delta gamma. The time derivatives of epsilon and gamma are zero because we are in static equilibrium. Yeah? So therefore, just the time derivative of delta epsilon and delta gamma has to be taken into account. And that's easily got, done here because it's a linear term. Yeah? So this would be the time derivative. Now we also have the derivative with respect to phi. And now, of course, that term is allowed to produce, so the zeroth order term is allowed to produce a derivative with respect to phi. Why not? The cosine phi clearly will do that. Yeah? So we get e sine phi minus gamma from the zeroth order term and from the first order term, we get the delta epsilon sine phi minus gamma and we get epsilon delta gamma cosine phi minus gamma without a change of sign, there was a negative sign. So this is at least, we have here the numerator for the pressure. And you can see that you have perturbations included, both with respect to velocities. Again, we have a squeeze film effect and a whirl effect. And we have perturbations in, with respect to phi included. And we have the classical static term that we had before. So we see the zeroth order term in the pressure, or later see the zeroth order term in the pressure, already appear here in the numerator, and we see the first order effect in the perturbations, both in the displacements and in the velocities. Now let's put this together. So um, I just copied the result here, and I want to include this in the expression for the pressure. However, as you know, there is the h cubed in the denominator of the expression for the pressure. So I have to linearize that as well. How do I linearize a function h to the power of minus 3 that is composed by a zero order term and a first order term? Well, classical Taylor series or differentiation tells you this is h, so the zeroth order part to the power of minus three, minus three times h zero in fourth power multiplied by the perturbation by h sub one. We will make use of that result and introduce everything, I'm sorry, it will be a lengthy expression for pi. So this is the expression for pi. Yeah? You see the h cubed here, which must be replaced by h zero to the power of three and by minus three times h zero to the power of four in the denominator and everything is then multiplied by h sub one. And we have to replace dh by d two and dh by d phi with the expression we found. And then finally everything should be linear. So we want to get the pressure contribution, the static pressure contribution and its first order perturbation. So this is the first part. This is the part corresponding to h not um, to the power of minus three. You can clearly see that this is here the unperturbed, the zeroth order term for h. Yeah? One minus epsilon cosine theta in third power. Um, you get three times b uh, d divided by d squared. And I changed the sign of all these terms here. So when, if you ask yourself, where is the negative sign here? 
then you see that um, for the h by the toe and for the h by the phi, I changed the sign. Let's look at the first term to the epsilon cosinus toe, which is two times the h by the toe, this one, and you clearly see that this is now a positive sign here. Second term, we have to take twice the h by the toe is this one here. And now we take the terms the h by d phi and we change the sign. So it's a negative sign. It's a negative sign here and it's a positive sign there. So this is the first part, which is related to the linearization of h to the power of minus three. Now we come to the second part, which is minus three times h zero to the power of four. Uh, minus 4 times h sub 1. And we uh, close the parenthesis and add the 1 minus zeta bar squared here. So you can see that this is h 0 to the power of 4, 1 minus epsilon cosine theta, the zero order effect in the lubrication gap. We have to multiply by h sub 1 and we have to multiply everything yeah, this is not kind of way. We have to multiply everything by 2 dh by d2 plus dh by d5. Now, um, as h sub 1 is first order already in the perturbations, namely this would be h sub 1. That's what we computed for the first order term in the lubrication gap. Um, when we multiply with these perturbations, the effect would be of second order and must be therefore neglected. So the only contribution of this parenthesis is this quasi-static or the static term epsilon sine theta, because it does not include any perturbations. So therefore, from that parenthesis, we just take the zeroth order effect, epsilon sine theta, and we multiply with h sub 1, because h sub 1 is already first order in the perturbations. So therefore, this expression appears perhaps shorter than you expected if you looked at that and said, oh my God, I have to take all these terms here and multiply by h sub 1, I will never finish, but it's just the zeroth order effect that we take from these derivatives and we multiply with the first order perturbation of the lubrication gap. Okay, still this expression is lengthy. And now we have to obtain the perturbations of the forces. That is, we have to integrate this expression for the pressure, multiply by the sine function and the cosine function and have to do the integration. The main question is what does change? That for the first term you see that with our Sommerfeld uh, um, substitution we are rather happy. We have 1 minus epsilon cosine theta in third power. Um, we have to multiply by sine and by cosine. That looks good. We have uh, cosine and sine functions. So there will be, I would say, nothing special. However, there are new integrals that will appear. They will uh, have um, 1 minus epsilon cosine theta in fourth power in the denominator. And in the numerator, they are products of either cosine functions in first and second power, if you project on the cosine, and then sine function in first power, or sine function in third power again, or um, sine function squared and cosine functions. So I would say the order of the indices, the superscripts and the subscripts, the subscript is, uh, uh, is augmented by one, and also the, uh, the indices as superscript, they will be um, increased a bit. Yeah? Let's have a look at that situation. So this would be exp the expression for pi. Um, we linearized or we compute the linearized bearing forces then and we get these expressions. If we sort everything, I, I will skip that, I think. You know, so you multiply, if you look at f sub r, you will multiply um, by cosine theta and then you will get, for example, here the for delta epsilon, you will get minus 2 delta epsilon I3 O2 and so on. And then you, you get here I3 1 1. Um, again, in I3 1 1, you get from this term here uh, sine, sine theta. Where, where is it? Sine theta. Um, 
cosines theta, so it must be ah, here, 1, 1, 1, delta epsilon 1, 1, and you will get here from the cosine theta by projection on the cosine theta 0, 2, 3, and from the last two terms you get delta epsilon i4, 1, 2, and the epsilon delta gamma on that last one here, i2, 1, twice the sine function, once the cosine function, um, and a subscript 4. And well, the same in gamma direction. So there are additional integrals, and these additional integrals will be found here at the very end. They all have a 4 as a subscript, and in the superscript you will find either 1, 2, or 2, 1, or 3, 0. Well, the good thing is you can easily compute these additional two of these additional integrals by taking the derivative with respect to epsilon of existing integrals, e3311 and e3201. There's only one integral where you have to do the computation u by using the Sommerfeld substitution, and that's i430. But I would like to skip these technical details because you have seen them once in length or the computation of the integrals, and it's not necessary to repeat it here, just to show you the procedure and to make sure that you really understand that you have to introduce the perturbations right at the very beginning for the lubrication gap, and then you follow it on all the steps um, through the physics to arrive at the bearing forces. Now at the next slide you will see an overwhelming result on the um, dimensionless um, stiffness and damping coefficients. What can be said about that result? Well, the interesting point is maybe the point what happens if epsilon is close to zero, which means that we are uh, quickly rotating so that we are in a supercritical regime that we have very high rotational speeds. If epsilon is equal to zero, then of course we have to pay attention here because there is the SM are always included. It will also be very, very large. But if you look at that coefficient, then you will see that the first one will then be with the epsilon. Epsilon will tend to zero as m will tend to infinity. The second one will tend with as m to infinity. Um, the third one will do the same, but to minus infinity. And the, the fourth one will also be balanced between Sm and Epsilon. Now these are the terms on the diagonal. Yeah? Of course, in radial and circumferential direction, we are not yet at dimensional quantities. We are not yet there to study um, the Cartesian components. But already here you can see there will be off-diagonal terms, and these off-diagonal terms will be of different sign. Again, this is a sign of alarm, alarm, danger for stability reasons, yeah? if you have that situation. Yeah? So you have very weak stiffnesses, I would say, in the diagonal term, and very strong but skew-symmetric off-diagonal terms in the stiffness. Yeah? We also saw such a situation, um, for example, for inner damping, um, for a Jeffcott rotor in machine dynamics. So those that followed the course in machine dynamics, at least, but also the other, should accept or know that, um, that this could be an alert. If you look now at uh, the damping coefficients. Now for the damping coefficients, things are much better. This one will go to infinity. This one will also go to infinity with SM. So, and very strong diagonal terms and the off-diagonal terms will be weak and of the same sign, so that's okay. Yeah? Let's have a look at some figures. Yeah? So these are now the dimensional, but the same transformation holds for the, for the non-dimensional terms between the, the matrices, stiffness and damping matrices, um, in radial and circumferential direction and in um, Cartesian directions, that matrix T is the transformation matrix that we have seen before when we transformed the force vector between radial and circumferential coordinates 
or polar coordinates on the one hand and Cartesian coordinates in the other hand. Yeah? And now it's applied from the left and from the right because we are dealing with matrices or where in fact we are dealing with, with tensor quantities and we change the coordinate system for these tensors. Much as you have seen for other tensor quantities um, when you um, obtained the principal axis. Okay, what can be seen from these figures? Well, you see as before, um, kyy, when it comes for the eccentricity to zero, kyy behaves quite nicely, um, kxx as well, but here you can see kxy and kyx tend to very large values, not to infinity, and they are of opposite sign. You can see here the um, absolute value of kyx. In contrast, for the damping behavior, there is nothing special, I would say. Um, it's um, well behaved yeah? if you look here at the asymptotics. So let's look at the asymptotic behavior once again, um, both in um, at now for dimensional quantities, both in um, radial and circumferential coordinates, and then later on in space fixed coordinates, you can see exactly, that's what I feared here, um, if you look at the asymptotic behavior with epsilon to zero and gamma to pi divided by two, coming so from the horizontal direction, you see that in the stiffness matrix, you have a zero on the diagonal terms, and you have a fully skew symmetric matrix. The damping matrix, is okay, I would say. So no influence on the skew symmetric or on off diagonal terms and very strong um, diagonal terms. So there's nothing to fear from the damping, but there's a lot to fear here from the stiffness, yeah? which really reflects the fact that you, if you press in, for example, in a radial direction, your system would react uh, in the opposite direction. That's expressed by one row here. Yeah? Now in space fixed coordinates uh, for gamma tending to pi divided by two, so for gamma equal to pi divided by two, our transformation matrix is just zero minus one, one, zero. And therefore that asymptotic behavior does not change. No? And this is really a problem. And this is the root cause for all the stability problems that we will encounter for rotors, we will study rigid rotors and Jeffcott rotors. So rotors that are rigid and rotors that have a flexible shaft and a rigid disc in journal bearings. And all these rotors will face stability problems due to this fact here, due to the fact that asymptotically we come into a situation where a force acting vertically uh, is answered by a reaction or by a displacement in horizontal direction. Well, and these stability problems we studied in the next chapter. The whole next chapter is to is devoted to the response of um, rigid and Jeffcott rotors in journal bearings. And not only the um, stability problems, but also the response to an additional external excitation, for example, by an imbalance will be studied. And that is a whole chapter that we need to study these effects. And that will be the next chapter in this course, Machine Dynamics 2. Thank you very much. And I hope you will also enjoy the next chapter uh, where the answer of the question, what we do with all this is given. Thank you for watching.